So this is a famous lithograph that's hung here in Paris. Uh, it's a drawing of a bull. And uh, I'm going to come back to this bull in a little bit. But first, I want to look at this code. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, a network client. And its job is to take a network request and send it and provide you with the result. So there are um, a few things here. There's promises and there's uh, generics. If you don't understand those things, uh, that's OK. Um, we, you can kind of still get the gist of what the talk is about. The promises and generics just make the code a little bit easier to read. Um, now, this code has four parts. So the first part is taking a request and uh, turning it into a URL request so the system can use it. Uh, the second part is sending that request. Uh, then it checks the status code of the result that it got. And lastly, it takes that data that it re uh, was returned and decodes the JSON. Uh, this is our class, and I like this class. Uh, why do I like this class? I like this class because it's very simple. Um, I like this class because it's testable. Uh, and how do we know that it's testable? Why do we think that this class is testable? Well, there's a few ways um, that we can examine that. We can look at branches, um, but one really simple way is to look at singletons. And this class has exactly one singleton in it. And that singleton is this URL session.shared. And uh, if we did want to test this class, we would uh, go ahead and wrap that singleton up in a protocol, and then inject it into a, uh, with the initializer, and then we would be able to, um, we'd be able to test this class. We can inject a fake, and then we can test all the different branches of our code. So this class is good, um, but the problem is the good code doesn't get to stay good, right? Some, something new comes along, always comes along. So what happens when somebody wants you to add a feature to your code? Well, so you know, you're, you're kind of happy with this class, and maybe it has a few tests, and somebody says, well, we actually need authentication for the API. So I say, OK, we'll add that. And then um, once that's done, then somebody else comes along and says, well, our app is getting killed in the background. Uh, and we need to be able to stay alive in the background where we send our, our net request so you add that feature. And then uh, a little while later, somebody says, well, the network activity indicator isn't, uh, isn't being turned on, so we need to actually count how many requests are in flight and then increment the counter and decrement the counter. And you know, our beautiful code turned into a nightmare, right? What happened here, right? Our class was so good, it was so testable, and now it's become this tangled spaghetti mess. And so, you know, again, we can look at a few things. We can look at the single responsibility principle. One problem with this code is that uh, it, it, it took on too many roles. It took on too, much, um, too many responsibilities, and it has to do those things. It took on the auth token. It took on this backgrounding code. It took on this um, counter. So there's like all these responsibilities that are in there. And they maybe shouldn't be in there, but they are. So we've got to deal with that. Um, another way we can look and examine how much complexity is, uh, is, is in this class is we can look at singletons again. Um, this class that had one singleton before now has four singletons. Um, they're highlighted here. And we can do sort of the same process. We can extract them to the top, and then we can kind of wrap each one in a protocol and, and add an initializer. This is horrible. Like, we don't want to live like this, right? We want something better than this. And to get to a better place, what we need is we need to learn how to abstract our code, right? And so, why now? Why not earlier? Why not later? And the reason why now is because we've reached a complexity threshold. We've reached a point where we really can't test this code very well anymore. We really can't read this code very well anymore. And so we've hit a point where um, we need to start to think about how to break this class up. The um, artist that drew our bull, uh, it started out as such a simple bull, and it, over time, gained lots of shading, and the detail became very interesting. And it's wonderful to look at this bull, but it's lost um, the, the core ideals of what it is to be a bull, right? And our artist wants to find that again. So that's why we're doing this now, right? So how do we do it? Right? Well, the first step is we've got to find these similarities in our problem. So um, maybe we can slice up our code and, and look at all the different ways that the code is similar versus different. So one way we can do that is we can take a look at all the different times that things happen. So one time is when we send headers, right? Um, headers can be added to our request at any time before the request is sent, well before, right before, it doesn't really matter. Another time slice is right before the request gets sent, we have some work to do. And then, of course, another slice is right after the request comes back. Um, now, 
But this code basically works, and we can kind of extract these things to the, to the top and then kind of break these things up. But we quickly run into a problem, which is that we had a piece of state for that background identifier code. You can see that state here. Um, and that state is used in both the before section and the after section. And so we can like, pass this around, um, but if you're passing around state, it becomes kind of challenging, and it's maybe a signal that you're not doing object-oriented programming right. And so this doesn't really work for us. So let's keep this in mind, because these, these slices of time are going to be important later, but we need something, a different way to slice our code. Uh, and so how, what other ways can we do it? Well, we can take a look at the um, time, which we did, and instead of that, we can look at the responsibilities that we've, we've sort of already talked about, right? Again, we have our auth token, we have our background in code, and we have our request counter. And um, if we take a look at those slices and then kind of extract each bit to the top and sort of replace, um, extract all the code out into our little classes, and um, essentially we can get to a point where the code is abstracted and our state is hidden away inside our backgrounding object, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. So we find that this can actually kind of work for us. So that's really good. Um, and that's step one of the process, right? To find the similarities in the problem. Back to our friend, the bull. Uh, the artist is, is frustrated with the bull, the complexity of the bull is shading, and seeks to find the lines that define what the bull really is, and draw those lines out to find the essence of the bull. So that was step one. Step two, we need to actually start to develop the abstraction. So we have this code. Code is lovely. Um, and again, we can look at those time slices, right? So we had our headers, which can happen well before the request is sent. We have our before slice. And, um, and we have our after slice. And so if we go ahead and take those concepts and rename our uh, domain methods, um, we can start to simplify this code a little bit. So the auth token behaviors, all it really has to do is add the headers. The backgrounding code, instead of preparing, maybe we call this before. The counter, instead of incrementing, we call it before. Um, and then again, releasing, call it after. Decrement, call it after. So now that we've done that, we've actually ended up with a situation where everything is defined in terms of these three methods. And that's really cool. So all we need is those three methods, and that's begging for a protocol. So each of our little side effects that we had before, turning on the activity indicator, grabbing hold of a shared resource like a background um, identifier, and, um, and, and reaching out into the shared storage to grab our auth token. Those are all side effects for our request. And so we're gonna call this a, we could call this a request side effect. But I think that's a little bit narrow, and so I'm gonna suggest that we call it a request behavior. This is a behavior that happens every time you uh, wanna send a request. Right? And it has these three components that we talked about earlier. So once we have this protocol, right, we have these three objects at the top, and we know that each of these three objects implement those methods so they can actually conform to that protocol. Right? So now we're getting somewhere. This could actually work out for us. And the trick here is that because every single one of these objects, all three of these objects, conform to the same protocol, they can actually use the same storage. Right? And so this is the real, this is the real trick right here. This, 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 this little transition is the whole trick. We take things that were different before, and we find a way to treat them as though they were the same. Right? And once we've done that, we can kind of go in and replace all of our header code with uh, a loop that checks all of the different headers of all the different behaviors, a loop that runs the before code, and a loop that runs the after code. Uh, and so that's pretty good. Um, so our code is not bad at this point. We like that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make a couple of tweaks to this, uh, to this request behavior. Uh, it, it's, it's a good start, but we need to do some more. Um, add headers is not bad but it requires knowledge about the URL request and how to add a, re a header to the URL request. And we don't really want that, so let's just make it a computed property, um, just a dictionary of string to string. Um, before is also not a very good name. Um, if the class that's implementing this protocol implements this method, they'll say, well, before what? I don't, I don't know what this is, so let's call before send. And after similarly has a naming problem, but also um, there's two, two ways this can end, right? It can end with success and it can end with failure. So we should probably split that up into two different methods. Um, once we've done that, we can add another nice thing. And this is something that you can really only do in Swift. There are a few niche languages, I think Java 9 or 10 or whatever number we're on wants to add this feature. But in Swift, you can extend a protocol and you can add concrete implementations. And what's nice about all of the things that we have, all four of these um, components of this protocol, is they all have a nice default, right? So additional headers. No headers. Uh, before send, do nothing. After success, after failure, do nothing. 
So this makes really nice defaults so our conformers to this protocol don't have to do any work there. So that is step two. We've kind of developed this abstraction that we're going to use. And our artist, our artist takes this bull and begins drawing out all the lines and begins simplifying um, so much that the shading stops mattering. It becomes more about the lines that define the bull rather than the shading of the bull. So at this point, uh, I want to stop and I want to talk about this phrase a little bit, this phrase, don't repeat yourself. Um, it's important to note that don't repeat yourself, DRY, does not get you to where we, to, to where we are. Right? We're not eliminating the repetition of code. We are finding common structures instead of common code. Right? So if we look at that distinction, um, if we have code that doesn't look similar and doesn't have um, similar underlying concepts, that's easy. That's most code. Right? We don't worry about most code. It doesn't need to be abstracted. If we have code that looks similar and actually does represent similar underlying concepts, well, that's really easy to just deduplicate um, and apply the DRY technique, and you end up in a good place. But if we have code that looks similar and does not actually represent the same thing under the hood, we end up in a place of pain. Uh, an example of this is if you deduplicate a function, you extract a function, and you keep adding extra parameters, if this, if that, another Boolean, another integer, and slowly this function becomes a mess, this is where you don't want to be. But if we have code that doesn't look similar, but really under the hood represents similar concepts, then this is perfect. This is what this example that we've been talking about is all about. And so this is where abstraction can go wrong. Right? Sandy Matt's a developer I really uh, appreciate. She says, duplication is far cheaper than the wrong abstraction. I think that's really important here. So we've developed this abstraction. Pretty great. Um, now it's time to build some tools around this abstraction. Maybe there are some things with this abstraction that can, uh, that can make our lives easier. Um, one example that I really like is this combined request behavior. And what combined request behavior does is it takes an array of request behaviors and allows you to treat it as though it is just one request behavior. Now, I'm not going to step through all the code here, but essentially it merges all the headers together and it performs all the before sends and all that. And it, it does all that code for you. And what's really cool about combined request behavior is once you have that, then any uh, array of request behaviors can now just be treated as though it were a single object. Right? And we have an array of request behaviors in our code. So we can take that, and instead of it being an array, we can wrap it in this combined request behavior. And now the complexity simply just starts to fall out of our code. And all these moving parts that were there before have become so much more simple. Right? The code is not necessarily going to be shorter. Uh, that's not really what we're after here, but it is simpler on a real level. And similarly, our artist is doing the same thing. Drawing out the lines, finding the essence of the bull, and, and taking the bull to its absolute extremes. So once we've built our commonalities and our tools, it's time to actually extract the code and build uh, the, the individual components that we want. Um, here's an example of one of our behaviors. This is the auth header behavior. Um, all it needs to implement is the additional headers. It needs to have access to our singleton, the user defaults. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. Check the uh, user defaults for this key. If the key exists, return it. If it doesn't, Return nothing. Now, um, this code is really great. It's super simple. There is one singleton. So as we discussed before, it's really great as far as that test goes. Um, the other request behaviors that we've talked about, I'm not going to go into the details of the implementation, but they can similarly be implemented with this new structure. So we have our network activity indicator behavior and our background task behavior. Both of them have really um, simple uh, implementations. Um, and that is how we sort of start to extract our code um, so that we can start to reuse it. And the last step is to reap the benefits, to take a look at what we've actually done here. Right? So the, the main thing that we've done here is we've decoupled this code. Right? And why is decoupling important? Decoupling is important because it allows us to have boundaries be between our different components. And when we have boundaries between our components, that allows us to handle each of those components um, in different ways. Right? And what do I mean by handle in this case? Well, one way I mean handle is I mean you can test it. Right? So when we look at this code, we can inject our singleton. That's easy. And we have exactly two branches here. Right? There's two tests that you need to write to make sure that this code works. Either the header is there or the header is not there, and that's it. 
Um, also, another, another benefit that decoupling gives us, it gives us reusability, right? If we had a different network client architecture, maybe we um, downloaded a, a, a library from some web service that have their own API components, we can reuse our, uh, our, our network activity counter uh, in that new code. So we can take that code and we can use it um, in this new place. And lastly, um, and this is a little bit more subtle, but I think it's very important, you can glance at the code and know that it's correct. So here's a new request behavior that we haven't talked about much. And it'll take a second to read the code, but not too long, right? Uh, it's pretty short. It's pretty straightforward. You know what it does from its name and from its really simple implementation. You can glance at it, and you know exactly what it does. So um, perhaps you've guessed by now, but our artist is Pablo Picasso. And he writes that there is no abstract art. I think this is really important because, as we all know, code is art. Uh, you must always start with something. Afterward, you can remove all traces of reality. And this is fundamentally what we've done here. We didn't start creating an abstraction from nothing, but instead we had working code and subdivided it into different responsibilities and then removed all traces of reality. Thank you. <laughs>